Welcome back to Faye Teen TV, speaking to the issues shaping our nation and our times. This week, we are continuing with our series featuring highlights from the recent ARC conference, which took place in the UK in late October. To recap, ARC has drawn together a unique alliance from around the world, covering politics, business, the arts, and culture. Their ambition is to draw on moral, cultural, economic, and spiritual foundations to imagine a future where empowered citizens like you and I take responsibility and work together to bring flourishing and prosperity to their homes, communities, and beyond. They say we are citizens from around the world, but each of us recognizes that our societies are at a turning point. The time to develop a better story is now, and we invite you to join us in building this vision together. So today we continue to bring to you highlights from the event. I trust you will find the content insightful and thought-provoking. Thanks for joining me. Let's get to it. Not so long ago, we thought that the West had triumphed. Western society, with its defining attributes of freedom, prosperity, and happiness, was believed by some to be the pinnacle of civilization. In 1992, Fukuyama famously wrote that we be, may be witnessing the end of history the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. But today, the Western idea seems anything but final or universal. Those triplet trophies of freedom, prosperity and happiness, more fragile than at any time since the war. But our decline has not been brought about by military defeat or economic collapse or natural disaster. Rather, it's come from within from the fraying of our social fabric, the network of associations that holds together our families, our neighbourhoods and our nations. We can feel the social fabric fraying around us at every level of society, family, neighbourhood, our nations, our social covenant, that shared understanding of identity and responsibility is under strain. Nowhere is this strain more evident than in the erosion of family life. The family is the building block of society. The family is the unit that ensures children are fed, loved, protected, nurtured, and raised in the virtues they need to become the responsible citizens of tomorrow. But family breakdown has become epidemic, with nearly half of British children experiencing the dissolution of their parents' relationship. The collapse of marriage rates, particularly among low-income groups, has exacerbated poverty and disadvantage. The impact of family breakdown on children is profound. It is the single biggest predictor of poor teen mental health and correlated with worse outcomes in every aspect of adult life. The support of extended family has been weakened and loneliness increased as young people have moved away from their communities. One in seven British adults now takes antidepressants and suicide is the most common cause of death for young men. Our families are in crisis, and the social fabric of our neighbourhoods is also unravelling. Shrinking membership organisations and religious attendance have eroded a sense of common purpose, a reluctance to prosecute petty crimes like shoplifting, and a failure to integrate immigrants have eroded social trust. Deindustrialisation and globalisation have ripped the economic heart out of many of our towns. At its peak, the steelworks in Stocksbridge, a town in my constituency, was not only the source of good employment for over 10,000 local men, it also founded many of the town's civic institutions. Fewer than 750 people now work in that steelworks. And as manufacturing has declined, communities have been left bereft without a shared economic endeavour. Our families, our neighbourhoods are caught in a spiral of decline. And our nations, well, the last few weeks have shattered any remaining illusions that our nations are cohesive or united, as those who hate the West have marched on many of our great cities. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. At every level, family, nation, neighbourhood, we are increasingly weak and divided. Unless we can find a way to repair our social fabric, the decline will surely be terminal. So how did this decline occur? How, in the pursuit of freedom, prosperity and happiness, 
Are we losing all three? While the trauma and the suffering of the world wars gave way to hedonism, after witnessing the appalling consequences of authoritarianism, we were determined to end all forms of oppression. But in doing so, we began to mistake all boundaries for tyranny, throwing off established shared norms and values that were the source of our freedom rather than its antithesis. Boundaries such as marriage, the sanctity of life, parental responsibility, shared heritage and traditions, duty to our nations. Without these cultural guardrails, our social fabric unraveled. And in the words of my friend Danny Kruger, the order of our mutually dependent common life together gave way to the idea of the individual as a fully autonomous agent. The idea began to distort the noble aims of freedom, prosperity and happiness. Where once we understood freedom as possessing the virtues to control and regulate our desires, we now perceive it as the right to complete individual autonomy, even freedom from material reality. Where once we understood prosperity as the ability of families and communities to provide for themselves, we now pursue superficial GDP growth at all costs, even when that means mounting debt, widening inequality, and devaluing care for the young and the old. And where happiness was once seen as the fortunate byproduct of a combination of luck and a well-ordered life, we began to seek instead the avoidance of all emotional discomfort. When the cracks began to show, when the idea met reality, instead of retracing our steps, we doubled down. And we began to look to the state to provide where our hollowed out families and communities had failed. Nowhere are the disastrous results of this distorted pursuit of freedom, prosperity and happiness more evident than in the damage being done to our children. To use a very practical illustration, consider the rising number of young children who start school in the UK still wearing nappies or diapers for some of you in the room. Now, I never thought I'd make a speech about toilet training to 1,500 world leaders, but please bear with me. Now, it might sound like a trivial issue, but the cost to schools is, in, is considerable. In fact, it's unaffordable, with additional full-time paid adults required just to change nappies and clear up mess. And the long-term cost to those children is immense. A child who's not been trained in this most rudimentary of skills by the age of five has little chance of being trained in all of the other essential skills and virtues required for a successful life. Just 20 years ago, it would have been unthinkable to send a child to school in nappies, but now 90% of reception teachers report having children in their class who are not toilet trained. How has this happened? Well, toilet training is difficult. I've done it three times successfully, I must say. It, thank you. It involves... <laughs> It involves getting your hands and most of your house dirty. It's not a pleasant experience for parent or child, but it's necessary. From parents, it requires the sacrifice of individual autonomy to stay physically close to your child at all times. Potty training can take weeks of dedication to the task. This is increasingly impossible when our GDP-obsessed economic system demands that even mothers of small children leave their infants in daycare to return to the workplace. And successful potty training requires a firm belief that a child's emotional discomfort is sometimes necessary in the short term for his or her long-term best interests. But our understanding of happiness has become so distorted that many parents now believe they should do whatever it takes to shield their child from discomfort a belief that's incompatible with successful potty training or indeed the training of a child in any virtues. In a number of other different trends, soaring childhood obesity, smartphone addiction, children who believe they can change their gender or those who are addicted to violent pornography, we see the consequences for children of the fraying of our social fabric. We now have an emerging generation who have never experienced the security of a strong social fabric who've lost hope in ever enjoying the same freedom, prosperity and happiness as their parents and grandparents. Crippled with anxiety, without the boundaries of social norms, robbed of economic capital by our addiction to debt, fearful of offence 
because we've taught them to be defined by their feelings. To many of our young, society is a failure, and they have become a fertile breeding ground for an ideological radicalism that seeks to overturn, to subvert what's left of our social fabric. As a politician, and normally an optimist, I'm usually asked to offer solutions, but I've drawn the short straw at this conference and have been charged instead with the depressing task of describing the problem. But permit me to offer this. Freedom, prosperity and happiness are not values. They're not a map. They're not even principles. They may be the fruits of a successful society, but they're not its roots. No good tree bears bad fruit, and to restore the fruit, we must first attend to the roots. The true roots, the foundation stones of Western civilization, are not freedom, prosperity, and happiness, but the pursuit of the good, the true, and the beautiful. This was our story, and over the next few days, we will explore together how it can be our better story again. If we seek first the good, the true, and the beautiful, perhaps true freedom, prosperity, and happiness can be ours once more. Thank you. We love Canada, and we want to see it strong for generations to come. That's why we do this show. We can't do it alone. We need your help. Unlike commercial TV, this program is 100% donor funded. If you'd like to see more episodes produced on important issues for our nation, please consider signing up to be a monthly partner or giving a special gift today. Every gift makes a real difference and all gifts are tax deductible. Together, we can build a better Canada for the future. Visit fayteen.tv or call 1-866-844-0844 to donate today. Welcome to my studio. <laughs> it is an exhibit. I am just so extraordinarily grateful for ARC, for all the conveners, <clears throat> to gather us together for these three days for what I believe is a historic moment. But as an artist speaking in this conference, if I were to stand here and speak stand alone, as I, I say, without my works, it would be incomplete. And so I am so grateful for Baroness Philippa to have insisted on bringing these art uh, pieces to be in front of you speaking already for the last two days. The one on the right, as we go from lament to glory, is my lament painting. I am a survivor. I was trapped in a subway, number three, train, trying to get home, which was located three blocks away from where the towers, World Trade Towers stood. Trapped in the subway for 45 minutes, and the first tower collapsed on top of us. It is a miracle that I'm alive. And I, for many years after that, as I raised my children who became ground zero children, and as I thought about standing on the ashes of this destruction called now ground zero, what that meant as an artist, I went into my studio every day trying to paint. For many days after, of course, that was impossible. But eventually I began to paint in layers and layers of pulverized minerals of Nihonga, an art form that harkens back really to 800, somewhere around there, where Japanese culture became more identified as a distinct culture at the, at the end of the Silk Road. And pulverized pigments became part of this delicate layering process of creating deepness of beauty. 
and the depth of beauty that these pigments can create. There are over 200 layers of highly pulverized vermilion, Japanese vermilion on this painting. It's called Water Flames. And if you see me <laughs> sitting there and often dashing about <laughs> because people get too close to the paintings, <laughs> <laughs> That's because these paintings are done with this delicate Japanese hand-lifted paper, the largest hand-lifted paper in the world. Not only that, this paper, Kumohara paper, is no longer made in this quality. This is a paper from 20 years ago made by a master of papermaker, in Western Japan, for generations, they have refined their craft so that this paper can be made in, in, in this way. And so you are looking at over 400-year-old tradition <laughs> of paper making, which is, has actually gone extinct. So I am aware of the difficulty of preserving culture. And at the same time, I'm aware of facing ground zero every day and then daring to paint to create the future. And that vacillation is exemplified, and as you saw in the video, of this art form of Japan called Kintsugi. That vacillation between looking at what is broken, something that has been destroyed, and yet you know that that is only a beginning of this art form called Kintsugi. As I said, <laughs> Kintsugi is now ubiquitous. You had saw it in Ted Lasso. You saw it in Star Wars. You saw it in every place, in commercials and everywhere. But it's only because in our fractured time, in a time of desolation, we long for a better story. And this story, harkening back to 17th century, 16th century Japan, is a better story. Kintsugi masters, when they receive an important tea vessel, such as this one, they often spend time. They don't rush to fix. They spend generations. Generations of tea masters will hold on to the fragments without doing anything to them to respect what has happened, to understand that some traumas takes generations before you begin to think about mending them. You see, we need to behold. We have this lost art of beholding. And in order to face my paintings, I often tell people, you will not see my paintings for about 20 minutes <laughs> because you have to behold them. You have to let your mind settle from our anxieties and our fears and the troubles of our days and to take a deep breath and to behold. In order to go from lament to glory, we must be able to behold. We have to start from beholding the broken. This is a better story because what King Tsugi Master was able to do after many generations, perhaps, of beholding is to not just fix it back to the original state, which is often the case of Western industrialized thinking, right? We want if we drop an iPhone, we want a new one, or we want to at least get it fixed so it looks like the new one. No, Kintsugi Master instead highlights the fractures 
And then using Japan lacquer, this venerable art form of urushi, Japan lacquer, they pour gold, they sprinkle gold on top. Therefore, accentuating the fractures and making something new out of the brokenness. And the resulting bowl is even more valuable than the original bowl because it has been through two masters. Two masters and a family of tea master who cared for brokenness and trauma. Do you want to know how you might win cultural war? It is to care for culture. It is to love your enemies facing the devastation of Ground Zero. I have thought about that, struggled with it. And of course, that is an impossibility, right? Of course, that might be something that only an artist can say on stage. Because art is about creating impossibilities possible. To give you a portal of this new vista that may not have existed before, before I struggle with that question, how to love my enemies standing on the ashes of ground zero. So this was painted in 2005, this in 2008. This golden piece called charis. Charis in Greek means grace. Our journey from lament to glory is through grace. It is a grace journey. And this gold has Actually, painting of, um, has gold sheets on top, but it is, it is the, the thinnest gold in the world, and therefore semi-transparent. I have five layers of gold. There's over a thousand sheets of gold. Because I wanted to depict coming out of trauma, and again, thinking about this impossible question of how can I love my enemies? by creating a work that uses the materials that is universally a symbol of divinity, which is gold. Doesn't matter which culture you're from. And it captures the essence of what this conference is trying to say, that going, moving from lament to glory, we begin by beholding and lamenting. But that act in done in faith will create a vista of glory, something new that is breaking in, something that couldn't have existed before the trauma. You know, we are all survivors. We are all survivors, especially after the pandemic. It's a miracle that any of us are here. And every day I count it as a privilege of this miraculous journey of an artist to not only have survived 9-11, but to be able to stand here today with these works some 20 some years later to be able to offer beauty back into a devastated world. And that work continues. My neighbor, Daniel Riviskind, who has been tasked to create a master plan for Ground Zero, was on the day of 9-11 at an opening of his building in Berlin. And that was his Holocaust Museum. He canceled the opening, flew to what is now Ground Zero, and he stood in the pit. And he said later on, when he was given this enormous responsibility 
of being the master designer of Ground Zero, he thought of the New Testament passages. He's a very devout Jew, observant Jew. But he said, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. I cannot create this building or any building without faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. What we do when we make, standing on the ashes of ground zero, is to create the future by using our imaginations for, first by faith. Without faith, we cannot create the future. Art happens to be also the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. And we are all artists in that sense in this room, considering what is the future. How do we create a better world for our children? And it is a way of the, toward the future that imagination can begin to unfold this impossibility, a better story standing on the ground zero ashes and to say with Daniel, faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things unseen. Thank you. It truly is my joy to be able to bring these highlight episodes to you, our television audience across Canada who might not otherwise find these highlights. It's our regular donors, it's our monthly partners that make that possible. Without you, we could not keep at it. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you would like to help us stay on air week after week, continue to produce programs, we would so appreciate your support. Simply go to 15.tv to sign up to become a monthly partner or give that special gift today no matter how big or small, every amount makes a real difference and is tax deductible in this current tax year. You can also call us at 1-866-844-0844 to give securely over the phone. Increase your monthly partnership, share any feedback, or make a suggestion for a future show topic, or even submit a personal prayer request. Our team is always there waiting to serve you in any way that we can. Lastly, if you want to ensure that you never miss a show, make sure that you swing by fateen.tv and see Sign up for our email list. When you do that, you'll be notified whenever a new show is posted or when we're hosting an event in the nation that we want to give you the heads up about. So thanks again for watching. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week.